Hey, everybody at Emerald City. Hi, how are you? Excellent, well done. I didn't hear enough out of you over there. Give me a woo. Well played. Uh, my name is Mark Bernardin. I am a host of the Sci-Fi Wire here at Emerald City Comic Con. Hashtag it's a fan thing. I am here with Pia Guerra. Hello. Who, uh, okay, I, I know you mostly from, I don't know, you did a comic book at one point, right? Yeah. There was a, it went for a few years. A few years. Um, what was the name of it again? Why the Last Man. Oh, that's right. I am going to feign that I was unprepared for that. Um, but that's not what we're here to talk about. We're here to talk about the fact that since why, you have transformed yourself into a bit of a political cartoonist. I have, yes. Not even a bit of, a full-on, I do political cartoons. That's how it ended up. <laughs> what was it in the world that sort of set your mind on fire? Like, what uh, was the it? The election. I think just leading up to it was so, uh, like, bewildering watching all of this happen. And then uh, he actually got elected. And then, like, okay, I have a lot of frustrations I have to deal with now. And uh, I just started drawing. And I was sharing them on Facebook and Twitter, and they kind of took off. One really took off, and that led to a job with the nib.com. And so I'm a semi-regular contributor there. Um, I mean, conservatively speaking, you've probably drawn thousands of pages of comics. Yes. Right? What makes the single panel political cartoon such an interesting form for you? Well, you, you, can't, you, you can't spend pages and pages to get a point across. You, across. you have to figure out a way to get it all in one image and really succinct. And uh, it's challenging. It's, I've never done single panel cartoons before, and so then to try and do this, uh, it's just you have to do a lot of thinking and a lot of writing in your head and like try and find the, the aspect of the cartoon that, that you, what you, the point you want to get across the most. Uh, and you can't clutter it with a lot of different ideas. You have to find one and kind of focus in as hard as you can. Was, was writing a thing that you always kind of wanted to, to get into? I, I've done it from, on my own for fun. And, uh, you know, my husband and I kind of back and forth write projects together. Um, and it's, he's Ian Boothby. He's an amazing writer, and he's taught me so much about the, the whole process. So I've been, it's a, a big learning process and, and, and experimenting. So, uh, yeah, I've been doing it for fun on the side. And this is the first time I'm kind of really, really pushing it out there. I mean, it... it it seems from my limited perspective in that I am, I am not an a inhaler of political cartoons, um, but it seems that, it, it, that the many of them come from a place, like you said, of frustration. Yes. Like that sort of nexus where anger and sadness yeah. meet. Um, is, that, is that the only place they can come from? No, I think it's, it's if you have something that you want to kind of point out, that you want to say, sometimes it's a joke. Sometimes it's like, you know, you watch enough Daily Show and SNL and, and Seth Meyers, and you see how they kind of, it's all about finding the joke, but that, that joke comes from a place of, of uh, sometimes it's anger, sometimes it's bewilderment, like, like what? <laughs> and it's really just that. It, it's, it's kind of sharing with everybody, I'm not the only one feeling this, right? So that's kind of where you know a good, good cartoon comes from. It's, it comes from a really honest feeling. Who were, I mean, there's, there's a long tradition and a history of political cartoonists. Yeah. Um, I'm sure one could consider hieroglyphs political cartoons. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, who are some that you sort of modeled yourself after, if there was such a uh, thing? You know, I, I, I always remember when I was a kid just looking in the paper and I would see these caricatures of politicians, and they were always these really fine line pieces of work. I don't know who the names of these people were, but they always stuck in my mind, like, well, that's a really awesome cartoon. And uh, I was trying to remember how those looked. And so it doesn't quite, I don't quite nail what they did, but whatever it ended up happening ended up being my style. So it's what I like to do. I like to do lots of little line work and, and really bring out who they are, as opposed to trying to exaggerate it and make it really goofy. I mean, some people really excel at that and can bring a lot of, of uh, information out with a really exaggerated face, but I like to kind of play with the image they want to put out and m make fun of that. So that's the part that's fun for me. Uh, and what led to you collecting all of these political cartoons into Me the People? I think it was just after like a year and a half realizing I have a lot of cartoons and maybe I should put this into a book. Um, so I had a lot of friends suggesting this and I talked to um, Eric Stevenson uh, over, at, um, uh, over at Image and, 
And he was like, yeah, we should do this. And like, but we should do it before the election. And like, oh, okay. So just to kind of get people motivated and thinking about voting. And so it was really quick. It was like within two months, we had this, this whole package put together. Uh, what do you think that, at least for you, does long form comics have any appeal anymore? Uh, I, I love long form comics. It's just that it's such a huge amount of work. I don't know if I could just jump into one again. Um, I would I would do it in like dribs and drabs, like you know, arc by arc by arc. But I could not in in any way do another 60 issues. That was insane. <laughs> and I, I was really really naive going in. And it was after I think two years in, and then realizing I'm just on issue 10. And uh, this is going to go to 60. <laughs> like, oh dear, I'm in a lot of trouble. Uh, so yeah, I have a better perspective now on how this works, and I don't want to do that again. <laughs> uh, what, I mean, what did you learn, I guess, about yourself and about the process working on why? Uh, well, I learned my limitations. I learned how to uh, shortcut, how to uh, find, find the, uh, the line in the economy of the line. I think when I started out, I was really overly detailed because I thought that's what you're supposed to do. I put so much pencil work into this, and after a while you realize, no, that's slowing you down. And so you have to find ways to get to the very spirit of the, of the line you want to put down and as, as, as briefly as possible. And you get actually more information that way. So I learned a lot as an artist on how to get an image across. And I, I would be, I suppose, a little bit remiss if I didn't ask you about the television adaptation, yes, which is it's, coming. It's coming. Um, and if you guys don't know, uh, it'll be on FX probably sometime later this year? I'm thinking later this year or the new year, where they're starting, they did the pilot last fall. Mm -hmm. We got to visit the set a couple of times. It was amazing looking. Uh, and we just got the green light last month. And it uh, looks like it's going to start filming in the summer. Which is ridiculous and it's outstanding. And also, like, if you read that book, it feels like this should have happened a long time ago. Well, yeah, you can thank New Line for that. They had the option <laughs> for a really long time, and they kind of, kind of was didn't know what to do with it for a really long time. They brought in a lot of different direct directorial teams, and they all wanted to do long form trilogies or multiple movies. And New Line's like, no, we we really want to do this in one film, and so it just kind of stood on the shelf for so long because they couldn't find anyone to compress all that down into one movie. So uh, when the option came up, uh, we had a lot of people interested. And so we, we kind of looked at what was, what was there and, and, and decided, tried to make, make a decision on who was the best looking team and FX was it. And how much, I mean, you, you said that it had been optioned over the course of time. How much control did you and Brian have? And you specifically, how much control did you want? in the process? Uh, I think at the time we didn't really want that much because we, were, we knew how much work was ahead of us just on the book. Uh, I think the, one of the bright spots with uh, the Vertigo contract is you can't discuss options until you're a year into the book. And that way you're not going to just start something and then tootle off to Hollywood. <laughs> By this time we're invested in the book, we really want to see it go somewhere and we're like, okay, we're busy. You do something beautiful with this, we trust you, go ahead. And because that's all we could do is we, we are at, I'm at the drawing table like every day. There's no breaks. So like I can't spare time to work on a movie. So that's how that was then. Uh, and how involved were you in this last version of the process? Uh, well, I'm technically supposed to be a, a consultant. Um, they, they sent us the first draft of the script last year, and it was beautiful. There was a lot of changes they've made since. I have not seen those changes, so that's about the extent of how my involvement, uh, except for after we visited, they let me know that there's a scene in, a, in an animator studio where they wanted some drawings uh, from the table. So they was like, sure, I'll, I just drew up a bunch of stuff, and they just plastered the wall with it. So it's going to be in the pilot episode. That's awesome. Um, back to politics. What is making you, I'm not going to say frustrated, but I want to know what's making you optimistic. Uh, I think just seeing how motivated people have become since, since Trump has come into power. I think just the fact that you have so many women now, you saw that in the State of the Union, how they were all up there like, yeah, we're all here. We know why we're here. And so it seems like there's a direction that's happening. People are becoming more focused as to what the changes need to happen 
and how to go about them and how to organize. There's these wonderful grassroots organizations popping up all over, like teaching people how to run, how to organize, how to, to get fundraising, and how to really you know, become a force in politics. I love it. I mean, there really was a lot more apathy before, and now there's not because I think more people are seeing how much these politics affects everybody. It's not just something over there on the hill. You know, politics isn't something far away. It's in our lives every day. It affects everything we do. It affects our health and, and our work and our, how we get paid. And to be involved is really important. And I, I suppose it's unfair to ask you, but is it, is it possible to distill that kind of optimism into a single page panel? Into a, a single it's a panel? Single panel. Uh, I've done, I think I've tried to do it a couple of times. Um, there was a cartoon I did um, about the Parkland shooting. It was, uh, it was about the kids, the Parkland kids themselves, standing up to the Grim Reaper. And originally, this cartoon started off completely differently. I was just depressed. I was angry. So I just started drawing this picture of, like, when's it going to happen next? And you just have the Grim Reaper there holding his M's. Uh, his, his, his rifle, AR-15, and, and he's got a chessboard, and all the pieces are schools, and he's just going, eeny, meeny, miny, mo. And I was really stuck on this chessboard. I was trying to get it to work, and while I was drawing this, I had CNN on, and they uh, started showing a live cast of the Parkland students um, t protesting, they're doing their speeches. And Emma Gonzalez came up and said, did her no B we call BS speech. And as I'm drawing this, I realize, oh, this isn't about the school pieces now. This is about these kids standing up to them. And it just changed the tone of this cartoon. It became really optimistic. It became these, all these kids saying, no, we're not doing this anymore. And so I think you never know where it's going to come from. But yeah, you can find that, that message if, you, if you're open to it. Wait, I mean, because part of the, the, the grist for the mill of a political cartoon is information. And is, is information. Yes. And I think part of the problems that we've had as a culture, as a society, as a people, is the siloing of information. Is that people are willing to get information from places that agree with, that already agree with the mindset they yes. already have. Where do you get your information from? Well, a lot of it is, is news, it's cable news, it's Twitter, it's, uh, it's finding as many articles as I can, The Guardian, uh, you know, just, just trying to find sourced articles that are you know, not just some guy on Facebook. Um, yeah, you want to ma make sure you're, you're, you're double checking everything and making sure that this really inflammatory thing that's like, ooh, even if it's on the left side, is it sourced properly or is it just a Photoshop? So it, it means you have to do the work. It's not, you can't just, you, you, and on top of that, you have to also call out others that you know who are doing the work. Like if you're, if you have an aunt who's passing along memes that are really, really wrong, you have to confront them. You have to, you can't just go and complain about it to somebody else. You have to let them know, like, no, what you're doing here is, this is misinformation. This isn't correct. Try again. And you know, yeah, that's, and there are so many resources right now. This is the thing. I mean, yes, the internet can have so many deg um, really negative aspects as far as like sharing these really awful memes and all these off like, bad misinformation. But there's also something that I loved about Tumblr when it first came up, is that you're having conversations on here that I don't remember having until like not since the 1990s in a themes and feminist literature class in college, and. You know, it's like all these, these, these really basic kind of information about feminism and, and about the, the ways that, you know, the, the media kind of can affect how people are so oppressed. And these weren't conversations you had until recently. And now you're ha they're being shared by 13-year-old kids. And I love that. I love that there's like this whole level of, of conversation happening that it, it's mainly because you have access to the information where you couldn't before. The only place you could access it before were those co those niche college classes. So it's it, there. There's a really great positive side. There's a negative side. You have to find it. Wow, you might have changed my mind that the internet is a garbage place that's always on fire. <laughs> that's not. That's not to say there are dumpster fires everywhere. And I am. I constantly deal with people who are always on my case. And it's like, but you just gotta, you know, be straight with them and 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 make sure you, your, source, your sources are right. Uh, so what's, what, what does the future hold for you? What is the next 
What's on the horizon? What are you chasing? A lot of personal projects. Um, there's, there's a couple of animation things I'm, I'm talking to people about, but I don't know where that's going yet. Uh, doing our, our, we're doing our own book, um, a, a book that I've been working on on my own for a while, but it's, I've written it, but it just takes forever to draw because, again, you get flashbacks to those days <laughs> at the studio. So I'm working on that, uh, doing more political cartoons. Hopefully when Trump is out, maybe there'll be nothing left to draw about so I can just focus on doing comics again. That's awesome. And Me the People is currently on sale uh, from Image. Um, and where can the people find you on the internet if they're looking? I'm at Piagera at Twitter, um, and I'm on Tumblr. You can find my the link on Twitter, but I've, I'm not very on there very often. I have an Instagram thing I'm just figuring out now because I've, I've been up until now really lazy about figuring out Instagram. But Twitter's my main hangout because I just love to, to bitch about things all day. So. <laughs> That's awesome. Okay, everybody give Pia a warm thank you, thank you for being here. Uh, I have been Mark Bernardin. This has been Pia Guerra. Uh, up next on the ECCC stage, Megan Rose Gedris talks spectacle.